and uh, I'm going to preach a message tonight. I'm going to teach you a message tonight that I've taught in the past. I, I've taught it numerous times in the past. And uh, I feel like I need to apologize that you have to sit here and listen to me preach to myself. Uh, because it's a big part of what I'm doing. And uh, so you'll understand that when we get into this message. But uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verse number 1, we've, we've talked about that already. But it says, for this reason, we must, pay, we must pay closer attention to what we've heard. So that we do not let it, that we do not drift away from. The King James said it this way: Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we've heard, lest at any time we let them slip. And it's amazing, beloved, as 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 long as we've been in this walk, how easy it is to let things that we know are right slip, or to let things. And Pastor Carla was talking about an offering time to let things that we know go undone. And you can wake up, just for instance, you know, we know the power of confession, don't we? I'm not talking about going in the booth and telling the priest what you did. I'm talking about confessing the Word. We know the power of that, but yet how easy it is to go a couple of days and realize, you know what, I, ha I haven't confessed any Word for a couple of days. Y'all going to be like that tonight. I understand. That's all right. Do you understand what I'm talking about, though? And then we get upset because it's not working the way that, you know, Pastor says it's supposed to work. And it's not working the way the Word says it's supposed to work. And, and I had somebody tell me just the other day, isn't God supposed to do this for me? And isn't God supposed to do that? Now, wait a minute. you got to understand, basically, God's done all He's going to do. So if, if you're not seeing the result that the Word has promised, it's not God's problem. It's not the Word's problem. Only leaves one variable left. Actually, it, it doesn't leave one variable left. It leaves the variable left, and that's us. And so I want to go back over some teaching in the area of prosperity and that maybe we have let slip. Now go with me to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. Because, beloved, and I know, I know you've heard me say this before, and you're going to hear me say it many times till Jesus comes. But I'm ready to go to the next level. I'm so thankful. I was talking to Pastor Callahan yesterday, and I said, listen, Pastor, I understand. I mean, we're going through. There's always a battle that you can go through. There's always a battle going on. And I said, look, I'm a blessed man. That's what I told him. I said, I can go in my garage, and I can look at how blessed I am. I can look in my driveway. I can. God is blessing me, but I am ready for that next level of abundance. I'm ready for that all-sufficiency and abounding to every good work. I'm ready for the accumulation, not just for me, but for everybody in this body, everybody that we come in contact with that's doing what God said to do. We're going to see this before Jesus returns. Amen. You've heard me say it. I'm not going to get to heaven and have Solomon come to me and say, I thought you had a better covenant. Uh, what happened? And there's only one reason we're not seeing it. Here's Solomon that's Old Testament. Here's Abraham that's Old Testament. Here's David that's Old Testament. And they're walking more in the prosperity that God's provided than, than we are. And so there's, something's got to give. Something has to change. So Mark chapter 4. <clears throat> and again, I apologize that you have to sit here and listen to me preach to myself. And uh, hopefully I'm not the only one that answers the altar call. That would be embarrassing. I knew a preacher that did that, preached a whole message about pride and did all that, gave an altar call and nobody responded. And the Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, it's you that I'm talking to. And literally he had to answer his own altar call. And so Mark chapter 4, and it says, He was saying, the kingdom of God is like a man who casts seed upon the soil. Jesus is saying, this is how the kingdom operates. It operates... We know this back in Genesis chapter 8. As long as the earth remains, there's going to be cold and heat, summer and winter, um, night and day, and seed time, seed time and harvest. It's how it operates in the kingdom. And it's, it's, the kingdom of God is like a man who casts seed upon the soil, and he goes to bed at night and gets up by day. Now everything so far I can do. I can sow seed. But isn't it funny that when you first start to get a hold of this, when you first start to get into the understanding of prosperity, that you first start to get into the understanding of seed time and harvest, that the seed sowing is the most difficult part? Yes. Do you remember that? Yeah. I mean, the thought of giving, if I give it, I won't have it. 
You know, there's no farmer that's a success at farming that is afraid to put seed in the ground because if he holds on to it, it's better for him. There's no farmer that thinks that way. The farmer, every time he's putting that, there's an expectation with every seed that goes into the ground because he knows that ground is going to, he knows good ground. You know, a farmer's not going to go sow it out on the asphalt. He's not going to sow it out in rocks. He's not going to sow it, you know, down in the riverbed. He's going to sow it where he knows the soil is good, and he does it with expectation, knowing that whatever he puts in that ground is going to not just reproduce, it's going to multiply. It's not just going to bring back to him what he put in the ground, or else there's no purpose in putting it in the ground. But he gives it with that expectation, and a farmer in the natural can have that kind of excitement and expectation. How much more someone else operating in the kingdom of God that's more real than anything in the natural? There should be an excitement. There's, you know, where we leave in a couple weeks for Peru, September 12th. Uh, Elizabeth and I, Pastor and Debbie, leave for Peru. You know, we go there twice a, a year. It's almost $11,000 for the four of us to go. Um, it's not a, it's not an inexpensive trip, and so you know we've been talking about the trip. We've been working the word. I don't go to war at my own expense. Pastor and I are both working that word. We don't go to war at our own expense. Um, if we plant a vineyard, we eat the fruit of it. If we tend the flock, we drink of its milk. And we've been working this. We've been working, and a little bit has come in towards the budget, a little over a thousand dollars. And we live in two weeks. You got to buy tickets. You got to make hotel arrangements. We have to rent a van. And all of a sudden, last Sunday night, somebody walks up to me and they said, um, Pastor, I feel very strongly, in Lexington, they said, Pastor, I feel very strongly there's something I'm supposed to do, but I need to run it by you first. And they said, I know that I'm supposed to pay for the trip to Peru. And uh, I said, look, I would never tell you to do that. Don't come and ask me, is that what God's telling me or not? But I said, I can tell you, this is what I told the person, I said, I can tell you everything Every major change that Elizabeth and I have seen in our lives, in our ministries, in, in our calling, has come after sowing a major seed. Amen. And they looked at me and they said, Thursday I will be in and I will have a check for you for $10,000 to pay for the trip to Peru. It's how it works in the kingdom. The, and, and, and they were telling me just the other day, they said, I am, I, they told me uh, Sunday night, I am so excited. I, they said, I can't wait for Thursday. That's the way farmers are. I can't wait to get that seed in the ground because I know what's going to happen. And we understand that in the natural. And then you come over here in the supernatural that existed long before the natural ever did. Yeah. That will exist long after the natural ever will. And oh, I don't know about that. I don't, I'm not sure about that. Well, he says, this is how the kingdom operates. It's like a man who casts seed upon the soil. And he goes to bed at night and gets up by day. Can anybody else do that? I can go to bed at night and get up by day. I mean, some of you got a problem getting up by day, but... <laughs> but my point is, do you remember when... this? The, we understand seed time and harvest. I, if you come to this church and you don't understand seed time and harvest, you're shutting your ears. Yes. But when the seed was the most difficult part of the process to us. Yeah. Uh, just like Pastor Carl was talking about. Oh, that preacher wants your money. It's all he's after is your money. Look, tell him. Yeah. I got no problem with that. See, if I don't teach you to give, I can't teach you how to prosper. That's right. Because you cannot prosper in the kingdom of God without giving, without right. sowing of seed. That's, right. That's what I was talking about earlier. I believe religion has messed it up. We're just giving to people. We're giving to people. And they become dependent on us giving. And if you ever stop giving to them, then all of a sudden they become your enemy. But if I can teach you how to work seed time and harvest, I'm going to be the greatest thing since sliced bread to you. Because it's not dependent on me taking care of you. You've learned how now that God will take care of you, and he does a much better job than anybody else can ever do. But that, that when you first start to understand seed time and harvest, man, it's like putting a crowbar in your wallet, isn't it? Mm -hmm. oh, I don't know about this. And don't you love it those first couple times that you give and the mercy of God kicks in and it's like two days later you got harvest back you go, yeah, I got this. 
I don't know what y'all's problem is. Man, I've been doing this for two weeks and look what God's done already. And then all of a sudden the next time, I mean, God never loses, we never lose mercy. His mercies are new every morning. But we get to the place that God says, all right, I want you to learn how to do this. Yeah. And then all of a sudden they don't work. That same person that was all excited about, yeah. you know, they gave today yeah. and tomorrow. I mean, they, well, I, Pastor, I gave $5 today. And I walked out of the church and somebody handed me 20 Praise God, I love this stuff. Yeah. And all of a sudden it goes a little further. And you're like, hold on now. It don't work. Remember, two weeks ago you were telling everybody this is the greatest thing you've ever heard. And then all of a sudden it gets a little rough. Yeah. you got to put a little effort into it. And it don't work. All that man wants is my money. Had no problem giving the five dollars two weeks ago when it turned into twenty. Anyway, Amen. Amen. and nobody else is getting blessed. I am. Amen. But we get past that. I mean, you you stay in there. You stay. You keep giving. You keep giving. And all of a sudden, it starts coming back, and you're like, yeah. And now, you realize, and any farmer will tell you, the most the, the most work you put in is not at the sowing time; it's the reaping time. I remember years ago we did a, a tent meeting out in Kansas, <laughs> and uh, it was harvest time. They were bringing in the wheat, and uh, you know you just wanted to go out and stand in the field and sing, bringing in the sheaves. But I didn't. <laughs> <clears throat> but I watched them because when it was harvest time, they would work around the clock. I mean, they, they pulled out all the stops to get that harvest in before it went bad. I mean, they would even band together. They would bring other... I never understood. They had the big combines going through the field. And uh, I asked the guy, I said, why, why didn't the trailer go with it? You know, it's got that big spout off the side, and it's bringing the weed in. And, and uh, I said, why, why, why don't they pull the trailer with it? He said, they go, they go two runs, and then they'll empty it into the trailer. I'd never seen it happen, but I'm telling you what, they were working around the clock. They did not stop until they, that was the that was the work time. That was the time you had to put in the most work. Everything else was kind of gradual. The, the getting the ground ready, the putting the seed into the ground, the tending was was but it, when it's harvest time and you take off, we gotta understand. Now look at this. He goes to bed night and day and gets goes to bed at night and gets up by day. And the seed sprouts and grows. He himself does not know how. Now listen, beloved, you got to get a hold of that. Quit trying to figure out where your harvest is going to come from. Yeah. Amen. Because as soon as you try to figure it out, you have told God, <clears throat> I really don't need you in this. Mm -hmm. I was really working this about a week and a half ago. And I thought, I, I told God, I said, I gotta, and I said God, I, I, I don't care where it comes from. You're my source. Right. You are my source. That day, I get an email from the insurance company of the lady that hit me back in June. Now, they have fixed my car. They have paid for all that. They paid for my rental car. I have no out-of-pocket money, and she just sends me an email. The adjuster sends me an email and says, um, if it's okay, we'd like to send you $400. <laughs> <Amen>. <laughs> okay. I said, uh, so I emailed her back, and I said, can I ask you what this is for? I mean, I'd like to know. And she said, it's for the inconvenience that our driver put you through. And uh, <clears throat> so, I, you know, I called, I called my insurance company. I said, they want to, they said, they just want to settle with you. And they said, have you had any physical problem? I said, no, I wasn't hurt. I mean, I had a couple of adjustments by a chiropractor, but that's it. And they said, I said, is this a good idea? And they said, she goes, I'd sign. <laughs> They want to send me $400. She goes, there's nothing wrong with you. I said, yeah, there's nothing wrong. I've never had that happen before. An insurance company offered to just send me my... I understand that's so I can never do it, but I, there's nothing wrong with me. I mean, so much. <laughs> I guess it depends on who you ask. <laughs> but the same day, I'm really working that, God, you're my source. I'm not going to limit where it's coming from. I get any... Well, that's just a coincidence, Pastor. I'll take all those coincidences I can get. We, just, we I've had people call me and say, "Where are you? I got to get money to you." Well, I'm in my office. How long you gonna be there? Well, you know, about another thirty minutes. Wait, I'll be there. And I mean, they'll drive to the office, run in my office. Just had to get this to you, hand it to me, and leave. Well, that's because you're a pastor. That's why that happens to you. It's because you're a pastor. 
Go ahead, keep saying that. I got no problem with you saying that. It's not true. But it's kind of like people confessing you fly your helicopter from Alaska to Florida. Don't stop them, correct them. I fly my jet, not my helicopter. See, if we get enough people confessing this and they believe it and I believe it and two agree on touching anything, I'm fine with a condo in Florida and a condo in Alaska and flying back and forth between the two of them with a stop over here. That's where you're going now, Florida. It's wintertime. That's where you're going now, Alaska, summertime. And don't get the two mixed up. No. We'll fly over Louisiana. <laughs> we fly over Louisiana to go to Peru. <laughs> he goes to bed at night, gets up by day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He himself doesn't know how. Stop trying to figure out where it's going to come from. Just know God's going to do it. I, I, I don't. I don't think he'll mind me telling you, but... Um, last Tuesday night, I don't know, about the second song of praise and worship, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, give your watch to Caleb. And I said, I don't like Caleb. <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> Caleb's like one of my kids. And uh, and so I took the watch off and I stuck it in his pocket. Made him a little uncomfortable. I was like, what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> but we're in the car driving home. And was it that day you have been talking about, I've given watches away. Like reminding God, hey, wait a minute, I've sewn watches. And and so you can get into this mentality of, well, you know, that's not going that's not how I'm going to get mine back, or I'll just go buy the watch that I want. Praise God, I love being blessed and being able to go buy whatever I want, but I love it when God just does it and the exact thing that you're believing for, somebody walks up and hands it to you. It's like God saying, Look, I got you. A few years ago. Um, I was wanting to I, I wanted to get a pocket watch when I was growing up I was a little kid my oldest brother had a pocket watch and, and it was really pretty it was one of those silver watches that was engraved on the outside had a train on it to me it was the coolest thing ever to see that ch chain hanging out of his pocket like yeah so I think I'd get one of them and so it was just a few years ago and uh, I was just thinking I thought I'd really I'd, I'd like to have a pocket watch and it was probably the next Sunday. Somebody walks up to my wife and says, um, I, I don't know if Pastor Jimmy wants one, but we've had this and we would just we would like to give it to him. And it was this collector tin, and it said Ford on the outside of it. Now, this is how amazing God is. I'm just saying I'd like to have a pocket watch. And inside it's a 25th anniversary Ford Mustang. Pocket watch. Amen. Now, if y'all know me at all, my, that's my car is a 1965 Mustang. And it's not just here's a pocket watch. Here's here here's one that's a collector's item for your car. It's a stop trying to figure out how God's going to do it. That's what He says. He Himself doesn't know how. Verse 28. The soil produces crops by itself. Now, look. Everything in here. But let me keep reading this. The soil produces crops by itself. As a matter of fact, in the Greek, that by itself is the Greek word automatico. You want to take a guess at what English word we get from that Greek word? Automatic. And you know that's true. If you have good soil and you put a seed into it, it's going to grow. Yeah. If it's watered, it's going to grow. Yeah. If you put it, it's, it's an automatic. We understand that there's a process that goes on, but it's an automatic thing. If you put good seed into good ground, it's going to produce on its own. And it goes on and says, first the blade, then the head, then the mature grain in the head. Now, once you think about everything that he's talked about in farming, is pretty easy. Planting the seed, I can do that. Going to bed, I think we got that one down. Getting up, <laughs> nah, I don't know about that. Maybe that's your problem. Anyway, <clears throat> getting up. Now the ground is doing all of the work, right? I mean, once you so 
There hasn't been anything that we've put a lot of effort into yet. But verse number 29, but when the crop permits or when it's harvest time, he immediately puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. Now, the work starts. See, we've had this idea, and Lord, I know you know this because I've taught it in the past, but we have this idea that it's that sowing part that's difficult. No, it's not. I'm telling you what, when you understand how the kingdom operates, you I love to sow. I can honestly tell you, I enjoy giving more than I enjoy receiving. I love it. I love it when you sow something to somebody and like, man, that's exactly what I've been believing for. But when you're able to give, I love to look at our giving records every January and it's like, yes, look how much more we gave this year than last year. When, I, when we travel and preach, I tell them, look, there's nobody in my church that's not going to now give me. Nobody. You're not going to do it. You're not going to. And they'll, they, I had one pastor come and say, Pastor, I, I just can't say that in my church. I've got big givers. I said, what? That should be your goal to outgive everybody. I love, I love talking about the blessing coming back in my life. I'm not going to tell you how much I give, but I love be, I love giving. I love being able to sow. I love being able to bless people. But the work comes. Bring, and I know in, in, in faith camps we don't like that word, but the work comes when it's time to bring the harvest in. Now, Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. Now, um, it's deep, so you may, I'm going to say it a couple times, but Genesis chapter 2 comes before Genesis chapter 3. You got that? You're right there. <laughs> right down, one down. <laughs> now, why is that so important to understand? Because what happens in chapter 3? Man falls. The fall of man comes in chapter 3. So what he's talking to us about in chapter 2 is before the fall of man. Okay? Now, he says in Genesis chapter 2, verse number 15, he says, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden. Look at what he says. To cultivate it and to keep it. Now here's man, Adam and Eve, in, in, the, in the garden, in perfection, before the fall of man, before sin entered. And God says, this is your garden. You can eat of everything in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Everything is here. Everything you need. Everything you desire. There's gold. And he tells them, cultivate it and keep it. And the word uh, cultivate means work it. You're going to have to work. You... Adam and Eve did not sit on their couch and fruit just jumped into their lap. If they wanted something, what did they have to do? And as a matter of fact, they didn't just walk up to the tree and then it jumped into their hand. Whatever it was they wanted, they would have to reach out. No. They'd have to grab it and they would have to exert more effort on that thing than that thing was exerting to stay where it was. Have you ever picked an apple? Yeah. Yeah. Ear corn? You ever picked an ear corn? <laughs> Trying to have something around here. Blackberry? Anything. <laughs> I need to ask y'all something because somebody told me this. I was, I was pulling up weeds around the dumpster in the, at the church in Lexington at Grace Main. You know, and they're growing all up. See, it's the glamour of ministry. I'm out cleaning up trash around the dumpster, pulling up. Do y'all make poke salad? You, okay, I'm just asking because one of the older gentlemen from Lexington came out and said, Pastor, you know, if you would cut that down and take it to church, people would make salad out of it. I said, I ain't eating this stuff. <laughs> you make it? Well, I apologize because I threw it all away. <laughs> That's what he told me. So I'll make salad out of it. That poke salad. 
no, not, not this bastard. But if you're gonna, if you've ever picked something, an ear of corn, a vegetable, you have to exert more force on it than that plant is exerting to hold it. Go to go back to Gen. Well, that, that's, let's go a little further. Here. Genesis chapter eight. I, I said this earlier, but let's look at the verse. Genesis chapter eight, verse number twenty-two. Do you understand? Have you figured it out yet? The devil's not just going to give up. Yes. Okay, I was just making sure. Because a lot, of, a lot of church people have it. I don't understand. I'm a tither and I'm a giver and he's attacking my finances. I don't know why I sounded like that. But... And they're like, I don't understand what I'm doing wrong. Like he's just going to roll over and play dead. He's like one of those little... My, my father-in-law has a little Boston Terrier. Oh. And I'm telling you what, you play fetch with that dog and he'll bring it to you. You can pick him up by the toy, spin him around. <laughs> Don't do that when my father-in-law's watching. But you can do it. <laughs> Don't ask me how I know. I mean, you can literally... That thing's not going to let go. Stop. Stop it. Stop it. Stop. <laughs> it's amazing how passive the church world has become yeah. and we understand why it's not working. Yeah. I'm not talking to you gotta yell. It doesn't matter how loud you are, that's not but the devil knows if you know your authority. And we have this idea that he's just going to roll over and play dead because we're in a faith church, we listen to Pastor Jim, and we're tithers and we're givers. Have you found out? Because you're under the word, because you're a tither, because you're a giver, you're dangerous to his kingdom. Yeah. And he does not want to give up the money. Because where the money is... That's where the power is. Whether we like it or not, it's the truth. And so, in Genesis chapter 8, verse 22, it says, While the earth remains, pretty sure it's still here. Yes. Seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. So we're going to live by seed time and harvest. Now go back to Mark chapter 4. <clears throat> Mark chapter 4, verse 29 again. It says, but when the crop permits, he immediately puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. Now this is interesting because that phrase there, crop permits, is, I like to say the Greek word. I'm not saying it correctly, but I just like it. Paradidomy. I like that. I don't know why. And it literally means to surrender. When it says, when the crop permits... He immediately puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. And that word means it, to surrender. So if it has to be surrender, then something is holding it back. Go to James chapter 1. See, when I put the seed in the ground and it's good ground, all the ground knows to do is produce harvest. You've heard me say it in the past, but that's why fence posts rot. Because the ground is literally trying to grow it. That's what happens. When you put a seed into the ground, that outside shell breaks down, and then the plant can come out of it. The life can come out of it. And it's the ground is trying to grow that front fence post, breaking down the outside of it. That's all the ground knows to do, is to produce harvest. So something's holding back. If it has to be surrendered, then something's holding back our harvest. You go out in the corn. My parents always had a garden, always raised a bunch of corn. Love, still love corn on the cob. I, just, I can't eat it without thinking about the one time my, old, my next oldest sister and my second oldest brother had a corn eating contest and sneezed in the middle of it. <laughs> Sitting across from each other. I will never forget that. I, I mean, I'm like, oh my, it was. <laughs> 
I, I still, that's, we're talking 45 years ago, and I can still, I eat corn today, and I'm thinking, you better not sneeze. <laughs> but if you, want, if you want to go out in the garden and get corn, I understand, beloved, don't, I want you to hear what I'm saying. If you want to get an ear of corn out of the garden, you're going to have to fight to get it. You have to exert more force against that ear of corn than the stalk is holding the ear of corn. If you're going to get the thing that you desire. And we've gotten into this. We're sowers. We're putting seed into good ground and then we're just sitting and waiting. And the devil does not want you to get your harvest. Because every time you sow a seed and the harvest comes back to you, it's proof to him that he's defeated. That's about, I understand, he doesn't want you to have anything, but every time you work the word and it works, it's another proof to him that he's defeated. <clears throat> so he, I want you to understand, number one, this is important. God is not holding your harvest back. We have things that we say, well, it's all in God's timing. And we all, you know, it's real spiritual when we say it. It's all, and we'll say it this way, it's all in the Lord's timing. No, it's not. Now understand, there are certain prophecies, certain words that God has said when the fullness of time had come, Jesus was sent. But this idea, here's the example a lot of people use. You know, when God spoke to Abram and said, you know, I'm going to bless you and you're going to have a son. God had already planned it to take 25 years to get that son to him. No, it didn't. God didn't plan it to take 25 years. Abram took 24 years to get to a place he'd obey God. It, it, God said, look, Abram, I'm going to bless you beyond what you can even imagine. I'm putting it in my words. I, you will not, people will be afraid of you because you're so blessed. Leave your family, leave your, leave your land, leave your country, and go to a place that I'll tell you of. So he took Lot and left. Yeah. Wait a minute. Lot is what? He's family. Isn't that who God said to leave? So now wait a minute. Is partial obedience obedience? No. Partial obedience is still disobedience. God says leave your family and Abram goes, well, he's not really family because we don't like him much. I understand Abram didn't say that, but somehow he justified taking Lot with him. And let me ask you, did Lot cause him any trouble? Yeah, A lot. I mean, you want to talk about what kind of man? Why would he choose Lot? That's what I understand. Because you got to understand what kind of Lot, but what kind of man Lot is. Because when God, when, when they had so prospered that the land couldn't hold them anymore. They said, we got to separate. And Abram, so understanding the blessing, said, Lot, you choose first. And Lot turned his face toward Sodom. <laughs> Do I have to explain anymore? <laughs> That's like me coming and saying, you know what? The blessing of God is so strong on your lives. You can live anywhere that you want to. I want to live on Bourbon Street in, in, in New Orleans. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? If you as a believer are believing God to live on Bourbon Street, and that's all I'm going to say about that. But that's what Lot did. So you got to know it wasn't like hanging out with Abram. He became like that. But they said, we got to separate. He goes, okay, uh, I want Sodom. Their sin was so bad. <laughs> Crispy critters is all that's left. And then God tells Abram, do not go down to Egypt. Where does Abram go? <laughs> to Egypt. Oh, you meant not come here. And then he 
gets down, he gets coming and goes, Sarah, Sarah, look. I love you and all. I love you and all. But I don't want them to kill me to get you, so tell them you're my sister. And so then they go down there. Yeah, we, I don't care what the king does to you as long as I'm okay. Just tell them you're my sister. <laughs> and finally, after 24 years, God said, enough's enough. He said, walk before me and be thou perfect. That's what, that's what God spoke to him. I've had enough. And one year later, he had a child. The right way. He had a child earlier. That's what you talk about. I am so thankful that God is so merciful. Because if he can use Abram, I mean, he spoke through Balaam's donkey. We got a chance. <laughs> That's my favorite part of that story. If God can do use a donkey to save a nation. What do you think about Abram? <laughs> Abram, I don't know how we got on this, but Abram is like... He didn't take... It, the one that God said it's going to take 25 years, Abram. I just want to show He could have had him at 75. He could have had him at 76. Sorry, it does take some time. I mean, he could have had him right, right away. But you knew Abram wasn't, wasn't doing right when Sarah comes and says, you know what, I can't have kids. Go have sex with our maid. And Abram, I'm sorry, did I, did I, did I say a dirty word? <laughs> I'm sorry, go lie with our maid. <clears throat> And Abram didn't hesitate. He goes, okay. okay. Now listen, man, let me explain something to you. That's like when your wife says, do you think that woman's attractive? And you go, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you better duck. <laughs> does this dress make my butt look big? Oh, yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> now, we're not talking about Abram being the brightest bulb on the tree. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? It wasn't that God said it's going to take 25 years. It took Abram 24 years to get himself to the place that he was standing right with God till he got to the place he did not stagger through unbelief, but believed God. It didn't take him. He wasn't, he wasn't not staggering for 24 years. He did a lot of staggering. Hagar was at least a trip. <laughs> When that Roman says Abram staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. It, you, that was a stagger. <laughs> you didn't just stagger, you done fell. But when God said, walk before me, be thou perfect, he didn't stagger. I understand, it, it, God didn't need him to be 99 for it to be impressive. At 75, it was impressive. When they were young enough to have kids, it would have been impressive because she was barren. So it wasn't like God, you know, God, Pastor, I understand, you know, I've been believing for this thing for years and, and God's just letting it build so more people can see it. God doesn't need that. You have to settle within yourself. God is not the one holding things back from you. Let me show you some scripture, James chapter 1. This, this whole thing of all in God's time. All in God's timing. Hallelujah. People live their whole lives. Die. Believe in all in God's timing. James chapter 1 verse number 5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God. Who decides whether he's going to give it to you generously or not. He might get it, he might not. Does anybody's translation say that? It says, let him ask of God who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. John chapter 15, verse number 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. John 16, 23. In that day you will not ask me about anything. Truly, truly, I say to you, if you ask the Father for anything in my name, he'll think about it. He'll tell you sometime in the future. Jesus said in Mark chapter 4, or Mark chapter 11, if 
when you stand praying, you believe that you've received it, you will have whatever you ask. So God's not holding it back. You have to settle that within yourself. Romans chapter 8. If those verses don't convince you, how many times? Oh, I'm just waiting on God. Hallelujah, you're just waiting on God. God's waiting on you. When we can settle that within ourselves, God's done all He's going to do. Because look what He says in Romans chapter 8, verse number 32. He who did not spare His own Son, but delivered Him over for us all, how will He not also with Him freely give us all thanks? If God didn't withhold His only Son, why would He hold anything else back from you? I'm telling you what, that verse is coming more and more alive. That there's nothing he'll hold back from me. God stopped saying it. It must not be God's timing yet. Well, in the Lord's time and I'll be healed. No, 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 I was healed 2,000 years ago. I'm not waiting for God to heal me. I was healed 2,000 years ago. I just need my flesh to catch up. First John chapter 5. Verse number 14. This is the confidence which we have before Him. That if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked from Him. Now, in all those verses I read to you, is there anything in there about God's timing? No. Of whenever God sees fit? Like God's got this carrot that He's dangling out in front of you just to keep you on the path. Well, I, you know, I keep it out here in front of them long enough. They'll they'll keep doing this. They'll keep doing it. We have to understand how we get these promises. Go to Joshua chapter one. This is real interesting. Joshua chapter one. It's an interesting book. You know, this is when. The children of Israel cross the Jordan. They go in to take... What do we call that? We call it the promised land. Now I want you to see how God says this. Because he says in Joshua chapter 1, verse number 2, Moses, my servant, is dead. You know theologians argue about whether Moses died or not? That kind of settles it for me. If God says you're dead, you're dead. It's kind of like if God calls you old, you're old. So it says Abraham was old and well stricken in years. That's bad. <laughs> Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, cross this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, to the sons of Israel. Now, what is, what's God say he's doing with the land? He's giving it to them. Mm -hmm. Now see, as soon as we hear that phrase, he's given us these promises or he's given them the land, okay. Isn't that what we do? You understand what I'm doing? Okay, I'm waiting. But now look at this. This is, this is just four verses later, verse number six. Be strong and courageous. Wait a minute. If you're just giving it to me, God, why do I have to be strong and courageous? Now therefore, or, I'm sorry, be, verse 6, Be strong and courageous, for you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. give them. Three times in that first chapter, he tells them, be strong and good courage. I don't know about you, but if God says, hey, I've given you this, and then three times he says, oh, by the way, be strong and courageous. I'm going to stop and think a little bit. Hold on now. Wait a minute. But go to verse number 11. He says, pass through the midst of the camp and command the people, saying, prepare provisions for yourselves. For within three days you are to cross this Jordan to go in and possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess it. Now, I want you to see that. He says, get the people ready, get your provisions ready, because you're going to go in and possess the land that I've given you. Now, you read that just in the way it's written in the English, and it just kind of sounds like go in, everything's done for you. But the word possess in the Hebrew 
It's yarash, Y-A-R-A-S-H, and it means to occupy by driving out the previous inhabitants. Now, do you realize the previous inhabitants are not happy about leaving? No. They're going to put up a fire. <laughs> the word actually has the legal sense of becoming an heir. You know, you, it's your inheritance. You have a right to it. But it also has the military sense of invading an area to settle it. That Hebrew word, it's your inheritance of what belongs to you, but if you're going to get it, it's like the military going in and taking over. Now go to Hebrews chapter 4. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 4. But you have to understand, the devil's not just going to lay down and play dead. He's not going to surrender. He's defeated. You understand that? He's defeated. I'm not pumping him up. I'm not talking about how he has no power left. But just like Pastor Carla was talking about, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And the devil has lied to the church world for so long, they've bought into the lie about how powerful the devil is. And the earth is his. No, no, no. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Adam and Eve lost it. Jesus came back and said, All power and all authority in heaven and on the earth has been given to me. But so many people believe the lie that it still belongs to the devil. But do you understand? You can believe a lie and you will live like it's the truth. Well, I don't know, you know, I, 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 can I get that? Can I have that? Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 1. <clears throat> and like I said at the beginning, I want you to understand, I'm a preacher, I'm, I'm a I am preaching to myself. Because it's so easy to just get caught up and I don't understand what's going on. I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do. Why? All I'm doing, God. You know, years ago I told God, I said, everything you tell me to do, number one, gets me in trouble, and number two, costs me a lot of money. <laughs> I understand you may not talk to God that way. You think it. I'll actually say it. I did. I said, God, everything you tell me to do gets me in trouble and costs me a lot of money. And I'll never forget. The Lord said so. Now that has a couple meanings to it. Number one was, so what? You going to stop obeying me? No, sir, that's not an option for me. I can't go back to religion. I can't go back to just getting by. I can't go back to doing as little as I possibly can in the kingdom. I'm here taking over. So no, that's not an option. And then the second meaning was, so. You want to see what I've called you to do? You want to see it come to pass like I've told you to do it? Then so. And that was back when we were doing television. And, and, and I'm loving it. Nowadays, honestly, nowadays it's not a whole lot of money, but we were months behind in our television bill. That's when we were on every week here with the, the local station, months behind. I can be honest with you, I don't know how they kept me on the air I, it, because we were way behind. And I, that's when I went to God. I said, everything you tell me to do. And so the Lord told me so. And so we, I, I went in to um, Alan, Husk was our bookkeeper back then. I said, Alan, how much we got in the account? Now, I'm not talking about thousands of dollars. I'm not even talking about hundreds of dollars. I mean, we had tens. <laughs> and I was happy. <laughs> I mean, we had money. I said, how much do we have in the account? And he told me, and I said, I want you to write out a check to such and such a ministry into their television ministry. And he said, Pastor Jim, that's all we have. I said, that's why all we're writing for. <laughs> <laughs> and we sent that money off to that television ministry, and it wasn't but a couple weeks. The money came in, we paid off the television bill, and the entire time, the rest of the time we were on television, we paid in advance. We and, and if the Lord ever tells me to go back on TV, it'll be the exact same way. We will always pay in advance. Every bill is paid on time every time, and there's plenty left over. Mm -hmm. All sufficiency and about to every good work. The funny thing was, is on my television program, I gave that testimony. And I got a letter from a ministry 
telling me if you're looking for a place to sow into a TV ministry, we're very good ground. Now the fact that you're asking me for it lets me know you ain't ground I'm putting into. Mm -hmm. Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 1. He says, Therefore let us fear if while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to come short of it. Now, but I, I'm not talking about being afraid, but I, 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 I don't know how to say it except the way the Word says it. I'm afraid of missing out on something God said. I, I, I fear missing a promise. I don't want to get to heaven and find out I could have had it. I've determined in my life I'm not going to get to the end of my life and look back and say, I wish I'd have. I know people live their entire lives. They're always talking about what they're going to do. Yeah, one day, one day when my ship comes in, if you can send any boats out, you ain't got a ship coming in. You hear people say, I'd like to go back to school. Then go! Well, I'd like to do this. Then do it! It amazes me how I, I hate my hair. Change it! My wife says, here's an accessory. You can change it anytime you want. I, I A few years ago, a lady came to us. She was really, she was beating herself up. She said, I just... I hate the way my teeth look. I said, fix them. That's what that takes money. My God's got plenty. Okay. Well, anyway, it's still the truth. Verse number one again, Hebrews chapter four. Therefore, let us fear, if while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to come short of it. For indeed we have had good news preached to us just as they also. Now look at this. But the word they heard did not profit them because it was not united by faith in those who heard. Same word. You know, you can have the same word preached to people and you'll have some people that have get it, make faith out of it, put it into action. I got this. And you'll have others that will convince themselves that's not for me. And that's the awesome thing, to, to understand that God is not a respecter of persons. It's not just that he said, you know what, I love Pastor Carla more than any of the rest of you, and that's why I'm prospering her the way you are. Our God's a just God, and that would be unjust. Or can I put it in terms we use? That's not fair. And he is a just and fair God. He's not a respecter of persons, but he is a respecter of faith. He is a respecter of seed. Well, I don't think that matters. Well, talk to Cain and Abel. It said God accepted Abel's offering and did not accept Cain's. What was the difference? Abel brought of the firstlings. He brought the first of his, and Cain, when you study in the Hebrew, Cain brought some of the leftovers. And we, we don't know because the word doesn't tell us, but what we can suppose is he saw Abel bringing an offering, and he thought, well, I better do something. And just grabbed a handful of something and said, well, God, I'm bringing mine. And God said, I, I don't receive that offer. I don't accept that. Now, <clears throat> go to 2 Peter chapter 1. There's three things. This is what I want to remind you of. And, I, and I'm going to go through these quickly because I'm not going to keep you here all night. There's three things that the Lord had laid on my heart years ago. And I'm telling you what, beloved, this understanding changed our financial status. I don't know another way to say that. And I can be honest with you, here lately I've let it slip. But there's three things that God has talked to me about about bringing in my harvest. Number one, I do not talk to God about money. I talk to money. I talk to my harvest. Number two, I command the devil to turn loose in my harvest because he's the one that's holding it back. And the third one, I command the angels to go get my harvest and bring it to me today. See, I believe it's a mistake we make thinking we're in faith. We're believing for things sometime in the future. I tell my angels to go get it and bring it to me today. Well, if it doesn't come today, what if it does? Why are all the what ifs negative? What if I die? What if you don't? <laughs> what if the plane crashes? What if it doesn't? Why are the what ifs? 
Well, Pastor, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in a new motorcycle. What if you crash? What if I don't? And the awesome thing is, is when I did crash, God took care of me. i make it very clear, I didn't crash. I was crashed. Big difference. Got run over. Motorcycle went over my back. Had a tire track up the back of my shirt. Didn't hurt me. That's the amazing thing about our God. But I don't get on my bike going, what if I crash? If I ever get that attitude, I'm not getting on it. I'm not going to ride in fear. So number one, I don't talk to God about money. Second Peter chapter 1. He says in verse number 3, I talk to the money. Because seeing, verse number 3, seeing that His divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Has granted. Is that past, present, or future tense? Past. Has granted is past. That means it's done. Everything pertaining to... Does, do you need money for life? Yes. Yeah. Now be careful with this answer. Do you need money to be godly? Yes, you do. Don't tell me no. What's keeping people from doing what God's told them to do? I didn't say you need money to be righteous. But if I'm going to fulfill... if. If I'm going to fulfill what God's called me to do, it takes money to do it. You all understand I didn't ride my horse here? You ain't fed that thing, right? You understand? So it does take... We want to be all spiritual. No, no, no. I can be spiritual without money. No, you can't. When it says... How can the gospel be preached unless they be sent? It takes money to send them. you got to understand money and godliness go together. No, 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 Pastor. No, no, shh, 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 shh. Shh. Don't talk about money and godliness together. I preached at a church in Brazil. And it was the weirdest experience I've ever had. That anointing at the end of service, at the end of the message, was so strong. I knew that God wanted to release that prosperity anointing in that place. And, and the same thing that I've done in other churches where I just said, when the music starts, I want you to do what God's called you to do, and I want you to obey God if He's telling you to give to the person next to you, to do whatever. And, 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 and I, I, don't, I still don't know what happened. Because I turned to the piano. I said, I'm going to pray, and I'm going to ask God to speak to you. I don't want any music. I don't want any noise. I don't want anything. I want you to listen to God. And I did that, and I turned to the piano player to start playing again. And when I turned back around, the pastor has taken back over the service and dismissed everybody. And I said, well, I, I don't even know what happened. And come to find out afterwards, the senior pastor tells the church all the time, I will never talk about money at this altar. I just preached a whole message about money. So you got people that have it ingrained in them. You can't be godly and have money. Godly people don't talk about money. Jesus talked about money more than any other subject. The Bible talks about money more than any other subject. Seeing that His divine power has granted us everything pertaining to life and godliness... I'm not asking him for money because he's already given me everything. You can go to Ephesians chapter 1. He's blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse number 18. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who is giving you power to make wealth. He gave you the power to make wealth. Do you know how frustrating it would be for me if I said, Pastor Carla, I have an account, you are a signer on it, and you have a billion dollars in that account. And she keeps coming back to me and saying, Pastor, I need some more money. I need some more money. Could you give me some more money? Have you touched your account? No. Can you just give it to me? He says, I've given you the power to make wealth. Now go make it. Number two, I command the devil to loose my harvest in Jesus' name. You know he has to obey you? If you're in faith, you demand in faith, in Jesus' name, he has no choice but to obey you. And he says, Matthew chapter 12, verse number 29, how can anyone enter the strong man's house and carry off his property unless he first binds the strong man and then he'll plunder his house? Matthew 16, 19, he says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven 
And whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. That's the power and the authority that we have. Bind the strong man, loose your goods. And then the last area. I command the angels to go bring my harvest in Jesus' name. Matthew chapter 13. <clears throat> Hebrews tells us that the angels are ministering flames of fire sent to minister to the heirs of salvation. They work for us. In Matthew chapter 13, now look at what he says in verse 39. And the enemy, talking about tares, the enemy who sowed them in the de is the devil. And the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. It's what they do. They're harvesters. So tell them to go get your harvest and bring it to you today. The example that I like to give is a few years ago, uh, most of you know Kevin and Diana Holleran. They own a, a flooring business. They own two locations now. This is back when they just started their first location. And they called us. It was a Saturday. They said, you know, we need business. We need money. We need the income in today. Elizabeth and I went there that Saturday morning. It was about 10 o'clock in the morning. Took communion with them. We do that on a regular basis with them. Um, took communion with them. And we stood in the middle of their store and did this. We started talking to their harvest. We started talking to their business. Started talking to cash customers. We commanded the devil to loose their customers, to loose their income. And we said, angels, angels, we command you now to get the harvest and bring it in today. It was about 3 o'clock that afternoon. And Diana calls me and she says, you have, I've got to tell you what happened. She said, a woman just walked into the store just a few minutes ago. And she said, i got to tell you. She said, I was home cleaning. I had no intention of coming in today. And something kept telling me, go to Kevin's Carpets and buy your flooring. And she said, I ignored it. I kept cleaning. And they wouldn't stop. Go to Kevin's Carpets and buy your flooring. Came in and bought $5,000 worth of flooring. Amen. Amen. Now, can you, and there's angels. She's out there cleaning. Angels going, you need to get over there to Kevin's Carpets. <laughs> you need to get over there and buy your flooring. Oh, Pastor, that's crazy. I can give you testimony after testimony. Well, we've done that personally. We've done it. And people are like, man, I have got to get this to you. I have got to. I'm not talking about manipulation. I'm not talking about standing over with somebody going, Lord, bring me my harvest. <laughs> Lord, I thank you my electric bill paid $187.22. <laughs> Move on somebody's heart, Lord. <laughs> Touch them, Lord. That's not what I'm talking about. Look, I've done those things. I've come to morning prayer back when we first got started, and you try to find somebody you think might still have money. Lord, I thank you. That bill is paid. Hundred fifty-seven dollars twenty-two cents. Lord, move on the hearts of your people. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about. I'm talking about in your time. Stop complaining to God about money. Start talking to money, telling it what to do. Do you understand? Most money is just ones and zeros in a computer. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. I mean, I've heard I, the, the one testimony. You remember when Dr. Conza was here? He's, he was telling me about it. This woman's a widow. Her husband had died six years before, left her nothing. She was broke. And so she had to pay her rent. And it had gotten so bad, she went to the bank to borrow money to pay her rent. And she sits down with the banker, and the banker goes, Ma'am, I don't know why you're here. And, and, and she said, what do you mean? She said, I need to borrow money to pay rent. She goes, you don't need money. She said, I don't understand what you're talking about. She said, Ma'am, you're rich. Said, she said, no, 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 I'm here to borrow money to pay my rent. And prints out her statements of her accounts. And she's rich. <laughs> she can't explain where the money came from. And Dr. Conza loves to tell a story because she said in the middle of the bank, she starts dancing, going, Pastor Jim, Pastor Jim. <laughs> it wasn't Pastor Jim, except Pastor Jim taught her. Right. God can do that. Yeah. We fill her accounts. Yeah. What a God. Quit trying to figure out where it's going to come from. Quit complaining to God about it. <laughs> I understand. I'm done. Being a tither doesn't mean you don't have a battle. Being a tither means you got the upper hand when the battle comes. That's right. That's right. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's stand.